All right, you're here with JTown Mechanic. I'm going to give you a tutorial on an alternator for a 2011 Volkswagen GTI. Uh, that is the Mark VI. Uh, this should work for just about any Mark VI GTI. Um, in fact, the uh, new Mark VII may even be similar. And also, it is the same alternator in many Audis, like in my Audi A5. The only difference in the A5 being that the engine sits longitudinal, so you do have much easier access. You don't have to strain with the bolts that I had. That was the only reason I mainly was looking for tutorial videos. I know it otherwise. In fact, you see now I've got the new one down there. I just haven't bolted it up yet. So you're not actually going to see me get, get to see me take it apart. But I'm going to go over all that and how it was from the start and everything you need to do. I'm even going to go over diagnosis of the alternator. Now, first off, on the diagnosis. Um, now, when you still have the battery hooked up, I have it unhooked now because that's what you should do when you go to work on this. The first thing you should do should be to unhook your battery. Otherwise, your power wire for your alternator is going to be live if you don't unhook that battery. And if you touch anything, you can kill the inline fuse or even, you know, burn up some equipment, something like that. So again, that's very important. Make sure you unhook your battery before you start with the project. But just when you're going for diagnosis, this will help you diagnose any alternator. And then there's one part that's specific to certain alternators that, you'll, that you can diagnose. That'll be like on these, but you won't see on others that I'll go over as well. Uh, you'll just need a voltmeter. Um, now I've got one all the time because I do have a, a system with subwoofers in the back and I have capacitors on it that have a voltage meter. I realize most people are going to have that kind of thing just in their car at all times. But just get yourself a voltmeter uh, test at the battery when it's running. If your alternator is running properly, you should be seeing anywhere between 13.5 to 14 volts. You don't have to check amps or anything like that, just look at voltage. If you're within that area, 13.5, 14, your alternator is doing good. Um, and in fact, you can even go a little over and be okay. Like if you're seeing a 14.1, 14.2, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that. But if you start really reading rather high, like starting at a 15, that was just a bad alternator, probably a bad voltage regulator because it's going too high, it's going to damage the battery. And if it's too low, like if it's about 13.3 or so, that's almost most likely a voltage regulator 2. needs to be changed out. Now, if your uh, voltage is inconsistent, like suddenly, like, it, you know, you first look it up and it's 13.8, then it jumps like 13.3, then 13.9, then 14, then 13.7. If it's just constantly bouncing, that means the diodes in the alternator are fried. Another reason to, to replace it. And you may just have it be completely dead, in which case you'll probably read 12 or less volts if you're reading just battery power at that point. Now, here's the thing you can only see on, that only happen on certain alternators because some just aren't built this way. And that is a clutch pulley. This is a clutch pulley type. You can see the cover. If you take this cover off, you can see the actual clutch work in there. Uh, you see that times on, on uh, like usually manual transmission or performance cars so that when they get to higher RPMs, they're not straining it. Well, that clutch allows the outside to spin so the belt keeps spinning, but makes it where the actual pulley's not spinning so it doesn't strain the alternator. But again, that should only activate at high revs. If you're getting an alternator light and your alternator goes out at low revs and sometimes revving up makes it come back on, like that's what happened to me. The light came on, but then by driving around, the clutch got activated again. So by the time I got to where I could have it tested, uh, I was showing it was working just fine. Finally went off of me again while I was at home and I was able to check my voltmeters in the back instantly. Dead, 12.3. Hit the gas once, tries to come back on, goes back off. Hit the gas a few times, clutch finally catches and it's on at 100%. Now, the fact that it's 100%, that means the diodes, Volkswagen will be good. It's just that clutch. That clutch is slipping. Uh, it's getting where it's not holding. So it just makes it almost like a light switch where the alternator just goes completely off like that. And again, that's the one when you have to replace it. But some cars don't have a clutch pulley. If you're having those kind of symptoms and you don't have a clutch pulley, chances are it's not the actual alternator. It'd be like maybe a short in one of the wires that's coming and going, something like that. But if it has a clutch pulley, that's usually going to mean your clutch is fried. Now, we'll go over how this is done. It's really not too difficult. The space is the pain in the butt. That's why even I was looking for one. I otherwise know how to do this. I was just trying to find some way to figure out the space and whew, it's rough. <laughs> but again, first, disengage your positive terminal or your negative. Um, uh, usually the negative is the best practice because if you remember the negative, if anything else touches the positive, nothing will still happen. It's got no negative. Whereas if, say, I was dumb and tossed this on top of the positive so there's a ground, it would spark up. But just unhooking your positive, if you're careful with it, will be fine. And what you're going to need, the four bolts are going to be 13 millimeters. So have you a 13 millimeter. Uh, you will need a serpentine belt tool. Um, let me see here. Ah, we got that right over here. Uh, serpentine belt tool looks like this. You can rent one at most parts stores, you know, return it, get your money back when you're done. And the tool, the socket you'll need on that is an 18. 
by two millimeter. Okay. Your tensioner pulley, this guy here, you'll come where you're straight up. Now, you can't go all the way, unfortunately. You're only going to get about this far. The problem with that is when that ha you're not going to have the belt totally loose, so it's not just going to be able to kind of fall off the off there. You're going to be kind of almost forcing it off. So you'll be kind of rubbing against the pulley a little bit. So you want to make sure not to, to that you don't damage it when you pull it off. But if it is in good shape, you shouldn't tear it up unless you're just being too rough with it, and you'll get it off just fine. Then you start pulling the alternator off. Now, when this thing is up, it's right about here. You have two bolts up top, two bolts here, and two bolts on the bottom. And uh, the two bolts on the bottom are the ones that are going to be extremely difficult. And you'll need some space for pulling it out too. Now, when I started, it was all like this. For this first one, it's going to be in this. The way this comes apart, it's, it'll slide away, and then you can kind of open it up. Once you slide it over and get that out. And then you just take that one that sits over the oil filter, push it all the way in underneath. It'll hold that out of place for you. This one over here, need to be able to move around so you can pull the alternator out. I'm going to have a bit here and a bolt here. T27 Torx get this out because it needs to be able to move because you've got very tight space. When you do get this loose, uh, you will have the wire back here, 12 millimeter on it. And that's how you get the power wire loose. Electrical connector here. And you see the way these electrical connectors work. You have a little, kind of hard for y'all to see, kind of a little tab up top. There. You use like a flathead screw wrench. Pull it back a little bit. You don't try to pull it out. You just hear it click a little bit, and this whole thing will pull off. Don't be too rough with it. You don't want to break that because your clip to hold it in place. And uh, once you get that, then you're ready to pull it out. You're going to have to pull it out this very tight space here. So you'll be very careful. You could accidentally tear up this or this. You'll you'll scrape against a little bit. That's okay. As long as you're just doing some light scraping, you're not. You mean you might cause a little scratches, but that's. As long as you don't actually break anything, cut through anything, you're okay. So if you do start getting it seized, if it does start pulling something too far, stop. If you break anything here, you've got a heck of a lot bigger job than what you started with. So just be very careful pulling it out, and then be very careful pushing it back in. It's just it's a, it's just a pain. And I was told to remove the boost here. That might give me a lot more room. It does open up some room over there, but it didn't help me. What ended up helping me... I've got a real short 13, and I was actually able to fit this one in there. But then also I found now what I'm probably going to use after is i got a 13 that'll actually fit a quarter, a little quarter inch, and flex head, and that I should be able to actually get in there. But most any full-size ratchet, when you're going for that bottom one over here, uh, usually you're almost out of room. You're hitting the radiator. So if you have a small one like this and a small socket, that should solve the bottom room problem. And again, like the boost tube, it did me no good taking it off, so... I wouldn't suggest that because I'm just going to have to be more, you know, aggravated putting more together. I should never take part in the first place. But that's where your big struggle is getting the bottom bolts, that tight, tight space. The top aren't too bad. They're all 13s. Just undo them a little bit and you can unscrew them. I would highly recommend fighting that difficulty uh, of the tight space and getting the bottom ones first. See what I thought to do. Because if you remove the top ones first and then go get the bottom ones, you know, it might try to fall on your hand while you're doing that. Whereas if you're going from the top, you can actually have another hand under it, ready to catch it, and not have one under it, you know, getting unintentionally hurt. And that's really all there is to this. That's just the one real difficult thing is just that real tight space. This should help you get in there just fine. And again, when you get it out, you get a little bit more play. You can't pull them very far. You can't just pull it out and do this, but you can pull it out to where you can actually reach it and get this power wire and the surgical connector, and then it's ready to come out. I kind of had to turn it sideways a little bit. You got to watch the, these. They kind of get in the way if you don't do them just right. And just kind of keep turning it until you can pull it up through here, through this area right here. And then you got to work it in this same area right here. And again, just be careful not to be tearing this stuff up 
Again, scratches are okay, it's to be expected, it's gonna happen. Just make sure you're not hitting anything so bad you're tearing it apart. And then just reverse this backwards, just get the whole Galtonair's wires first, then get it bolted up, then get the, the belt on it, and then go ahead and put all these hoses back together. And that will be your entire job. Uh, once you get it running, just use the voltmeter again, make sure it's in that range I told you, and you are good to go. And that is how to change alternators on Mark 6 GTIs or just about any version or any uh, car that has this four-cylinder uh, TSI engine.